so many builders trial systems, ideas, estimating tools, resources for decades and sometimes never nail it. The Not Just a Builder program is a way for builders to get access to all the right systems, all the right training and the help to set up your business well so that you're nailing it from the start. The program covers business strategy, marketing, accounting, scheduling, job costing, time management, ways to retire, and much, much more. So if you're a new business or a 20-year-old business, check out the Not Just a Builder program on the C Business Solutions website. Janine Alice is the founder of Boost Juice, which she started in her home in 2000. She also co-owns Retail Zoo, which is the parent company of things like Chibo Espresso and Betty's Burgers. Janine's the best-selling author of The Accidental Entrepreneur, and you will have spotted her on TV, Shark Tank, Australian Survivor, Australian Celebrity Apprentice, and keep your eyes out for Food Stars Australia. Welcome to the podcast, Janine. Thanks for having me, guys. Start Boost Juice or... Play netball for Australia. Oh, boost. Oh, really? Yeah, boost. Oh, look, you know, I did did enjoy my netball. My netball was a bit obsessed. But, uh, no, I think uh, boost had a lot lot more more longevity, I think, than my netball career. (laughs) Because I kept reading that you do love netball. How far did you get? Uh, Look, I was actually, uh, I I started playing when I was eight and I played rep. Um, and you know, was you know, played basically five days a week. Was going, I was actually turned 21, and they asked me to go and play to play for some um uh, state league teams, but I just wanted to travel, so I sort of and I traveled for seven years. So, pretty much when I came back after seven years, I got back into it, but you know, by that stage, you know, I had life to get in on, on to, so I played it more socially after that. Yeah, nice. I had three older sisters that played netball. I am a bit of a netball fan, so I can appreciate that. Didn't make state levels, of course, but anyway. Um, so you you mentioned you know travel, like you went straight in travel because I, I was I've heard you on different podcasts and you talked about how I was a I grew up in the sixties. It was a real traditional sort of family, um, and you know upbringing. But I don't see you as traditional thinker. I see you as someone who's like I'm going to think outside the square. I'm going to travel the world. What where did that come from? Uh, I, I don't know where it comes from. I think it, you, I mean, you might say the same to yourself. You know, you might have a passion for something. Where does it come from? It just, you just come from that thing of there's more. You know, you're right. I came from the, you know, the burbs of Melbourne um, where, you know, there was not much to do other than netball and, you know, everyone was sort of like that, you know, the, you know, no one was managers or leaders or business owners. They were just all good, good, solid Australian workers um so there was no one around me that would that could sort of inspire you to be more than um but I think for me it was like I just knew there was more and wanted to want an adventure and you know really the adventure came with putting a backpack on my back and heading overseas at 21 you know and back then there was no um there was no internet there was no mobile phone there was it was pretty much snail mail was the only way to communicate to people and you know, that it taught you a lot as a young, naive girl going overseas on her own and got, got myself to all sorts of mischief or well, trouble well, just pe- by being naive. That's good. I mean, activity creates opportunity, one of my favourite sayings. But, you know, I hear people travel and they end up working in a burger shop or a coffee shop or picking um, strawberries or whatnot. You end up on David Bowie's boat. How do mm-hmm. you land that gig? Look, you know, as an Australian, it wasn't easy to work because you had an Australian passport, so I wasn't a European. So you just speak to people. So I was in, I started off as a camp counsellor in San Francisco and then I went over to uh, France and I was a nanny in France. And then from there I sold timeshare at a Port- in Portugal. And I pretty much by the time I arrived in France, I, only because I heard that you can get some jobs on boats, right? Now, these days you've got to be qualified. Back then it was like just <laughs> You'll do. rock up. Rock up to the local Harry's bar and, and see if you can, you know, speak to, skip to a skipper is pretty much how you got your job. Um, and pretty much I was $20. $20. I had cash my ticket home. Um, I had so no way of getting back, you know, and, you know, credit card debt. So I had no money. But it's really interesting when you're 21. You just go, it'll work out. Don't know how. We'll work out. So I remember putting my backpack on and heard that, you know, the, the mo- most of the yachties were at Harry's Bar in Antibes and I rocked up and met a guy and he said, oh, yeah, there's a job going in 
in uh, Villeneuve Bay on a boat called Deneb Star. Um, so I rocked up and told them I had all this incredible experience from the yachting industry in Melbourne, not, and there was no internet to check. Um, and I got myself a job as a head stewardess. <laughs> had no idea about front, back, left, right. No, no idea. But I got myself a job, and then six weeks later, Bowie bought it. Wow! And you stayed with the boat, and therefore yes. with Bowie. Yeah, stayed with the boat for a couple of years. Um, you know, so he had, you know, his mates were all, like, you know, Mick Jagger was genuinely is one of his best friends. Um, and you know, so you know, what was it? You know, Jerry Hall and Robin Williams and Eric Idle and. Steve Martin and all sorts of people were on the boat at the time. and But, you know, it actually taught me one of my first lessons in business actually was because um, I always thought, I don't know about you guys, I always thought that there was us people, you know, us normal people that, that just, and then there's super people, you know, you know super people that, um, you know, they, cause they surely can't go to the toilet at the same as us, you know, they have to be different. <laughs> but it actually taught me that they were actually had the same, you know, fears and dreams and, you know, some were nice, some were assholes like normal people, you know, so... They were, and Bowie was one of the nice guys, just mm. just for the record. That's good. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was one of those things that I just kind of it helped me when I went into business as a girl who probably had the least education of anyone else in the room, uh, not feeling less than. Mm. Apart from that lesson, and apart from lying on your CV, what did you learn? What what wouldn't you be today if you hadn't have done that travel in your early twenties, given your business experience now? I think the other thing travel taught you was problem solving because failure wasn't an option you know there was a there was a guy I'll tell you one story I was um in on tape and <laughs> I had to get around so I put my thumb out and this guy picked me up and he was uh he said he was a producer the Cannes Film Festival was on at the time and Cannes, Cannes was only about I don't know 45, 45 minutes up the road and he said to me that um that he thought that, um, you know, I, I, I do soft porn and I think you'd be amazing and all this. I'm 21 going, far out, I'm in a bit of trouble here. And um, I asked him to drop me off and he kept driving. I thought, oh, I'm, I'm in serious trouble here. Wow. And, you know, back then, as I said, no mobile phones. My parents didn't even know what country I was in. So in the end, you had to really think really quickly. And, and so I sort of went, yes, it's, I've always wanted to be into soft porn. <laughs> this is exactly what I want to do. Roll with it. Yes, great. I'd love to. Can we meet tomorrow because I'm catching up with a friend who's expecting me to do that. So, so it's really those, and look, luckily I didn't do any soft porn, just so you know. You can check the internet. <laughs> didn't happen. But, um, but yeah. So you I got away. Myself into, <laughs> got myself in and out of, out of trouble. Um, and, look, there was, there was other times, you know, I was in Portugal with two guys in the back with a contract and contract down their life. I thought I was in some sort of born identity sort of um, uh, movie. So there was all sorts of things you get yourself into pickles with, but you have to actually solve them. Uh, you have to solve problems like, and, and solve them in countries that I don't speak the language, I don't understand the system, and but you just got to keep at it until you find a way. And I think that's what business is. If you need one skill in business is to – Always, always have an answer. And there is always an answer. Even though you want to give up, you just don't. That's awesome. I tell you what, that is something I did not know. So I really love you sharing those crazy stories because that oh, I didn't know where that was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it didn't go where, uh, where you it could have. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, so, so you talk about business, great segue. So eventually at 35, you come back home and you start, you know, uh, there's a, there's a, what was it? 27. 27. Where did I get 35 from? Anyway, so 27. We start Boost Juice. That's, you oh, know. Oh, sorry. I thought you meant come back from overseas. Yeah, oh. I was 27. Did yeah. you spend yeah. six back. years abroad? Yeah, I did. I told my mum I was going for three months. Yeah. And I came back seven years later with a two-year-old. Wow. wow. And so, so I mean, between travelling the world, you know, having a newborn, then going, what the heck, I'm going to start a business. What what? How did that happen? Because you talk about problem solving, that's not problem solving. Now that's creation. That's entrepreneurship. Yeah. Maybe you know, she we, had a bad juice and said, "We need well, to problem solve this." Solve this. Yes. We need to problem solve that. Look, you know, <laughs> I think what it's look. I, when I got back, I um, I worked for Village Roadshow for a while, uh, and then I, when I was about twenty eight, so probably twenty twenty eight twenty nine, I met my now husband, and um, he was in radio. He was this big, big, big big deal in Austereo. One of those super people, yes. <laughs> yeah, one of those super people, right. And um, and he was, you know, top executive, blah, blah, blah. And um, 
And we, we met and had a couple more kids. And it was probably, and then I started working for a company called United International Pictures. Actually, I was working for them before I met Jeff. And I was on maternity leave and I, and I really was going, I don't want to work for someone again. I want to create my own business. I've got three little kids now at home. Um, I want to have time for them. I want to create, I want to create a life that works for me, not the other way around. And, um, and I actually thought it'd be really good if, you know, if I could work a little bit part time, but have something really interesting and, and creative. And, <laughs> and then, um, so we did a few things. We did something called, um, love checks, which was like, instead of giving flowers, you give, a, a docket that says, you know, uh, I'll be the designated driver tonight or, you know, that's sort of a, just a cute thing. That didn't kind of work. We, tr- we tried to tour comedians because I was a publicist. He was in radio. That didn't work. And it was actually on a trip to America that we saw the category of smoothies and juices. And it's, you know, all businesses start with, wouldn't it be good if, wouldn't it be good if I could get more fruit and vegetables into people's diet, right? That would be really good. And there was nothing 23 years ago, there was nothing out there other than pretty much chips, pies and sandwiches. And so it, I really thought there was an opportunity to um, to really lean into it and actually create something. And keep in mind, I had no idea how to do business. Like I'd never led anything. I didn't know the difference between debit or credit. I never didn't know accounting, didn't know how to, didn't know how to pay anyone. I didn't know anything. So literally, I think that naivety plays a huge part because if I sort of knew what it took to get the business where it is today, it would be just too hard. Like, piss off. That's just, that would be, that's a lot of sleepless nights. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I pretty much started with the, the a business plan with Boost Juice on it and off I went. Yeah, wow. Because you, you, you talk about, you know, I guess the, the, the big wall of business and all the things to learn and how, how much of a deterrent that is. You know, I, I, I use um, Adam McDougall, local Newcastle person who started the Man Shake. And he spent apparently um, 250 grand in market research before he even decided to press play on it. I mean, your market research was, you know, okay, I want to get veggies into people and fruit wouldn't it into be good people. If. Wouldn't that be good? And <laughs> that's pretty yeah, good. No, no, my market research was my kids' friends going, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? What do you reckon? <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, we'll put that one on. Okay. I can wow. taste that. I, that's a good one. Janine, where was the first one and does it still exist? Uh, yes and no. Um, it's, the first one was in King William Street in Adelaide, hence why we have the King William Chocolate because it was King Lee Street. It was our first one. Um, the site was shocking. We did the worst lease. Uh, it was in a heritage building. We couldn't do anything. There was no air con- It was shocking. No air conditioning. Um, so there's still one close to it because we had to move it, but no, that's, that's not operating. But um, but no, it was, yeah, so we pretty much, literally, this is a true story, we we opened our doors at 11 o'clock in, in the CBD and normally it's dead. So I opened the doors and we had wheatgrass there and, you know, the store was ugly, right? It looked like it was the wrong colours. It was not what it looks like now. And literally about 50 people walked in and I went, shit, how how hard is this retail business? This is easy, right? There's people coming in, they were confused, they were looking around, they didn't know for a nursery or what the hell we were. And... Um, and so this lady turned to me and she said, oh, wow, you're open. I said, yeah, how did you hear about it? She said, oh, we hadn't. There was a bomb scare next door and there was nowhere else to go but here. I went, okay. okay so let's make you some drinks. Come in. Let me tell you, let me tell you about our business. Gorilla but, you know, marketing if, right if there. You yeah. about, <laughs> if you think about Boost Juice today, right, so it's a it's an Australian icon. Everyone knows that smoothies are a part of our diet. Back then it was literally, I remember sitting with the staff looking at me going, I don't even know what we are, and going, this is a jug right now what we make is smoothies let me show you what we put in it so it really started like that wow because i I actually remember going to the first one in newcastle i believe Mm. which is charlestown square and i thought Mm -hmm. this is the best thing on earth i mean what is this thing and 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 it feels like it was only yesterday that that happened so for yeah. you, it's such a journey to, to even go back and reminisce about the first store and what it was like and bomb scare created people in it. Like, I think it's it's pretty awesome to think about that. Yeah, look, it's, it is your life, you know. So I'm sure even you guys, right, so if you think about your life in clumps, right, so you've got, you've had your, you know, your, your netball years and then you have your travel years and then you have your baby years and then you have, like, so you have, like, chunks. Where you're, not, you're the same person but you're sort of having a different journey. Um, so, so I don't think it's anything special. I think, you know, you guys, I'm sure have had your clumps of what you do, but you know, when people sort of say, oh, you know, you're, you're successful, I think, well, no, we're not there yet. You know, the, I think, um, 
with businesses, you, I think I see them as like this Volvo where it's got airbags everywhere and you don't know where you're going to get hit. So I'm never, I'm one of these people that don't go, hey, yes, we've made it, right? Because I think, well, what happens if COVID hits? <laughs> you know, I didn't, in all my risk plans, I didn't hear a, a world pandemic wasn't in there, that the whole world shut down. I didn't have that. It wasn't written down. <laughs> And and you're right because it's it's not necessarily about driving the best car and have everything organised. You're pretty much got to be like bumper bowling or bumper cars where you go. I'm going to hit some roadblocks. I'm going to bounce mm. off and I'm going to try to point as straight as I can before I hit another bumper. And, and you'd pretty much bumper your way down as long as you're heading forward and as long as you're putting energy into it and I guess staying on your toes, you'll survive. No, no correct. And that's a great analogy. You know, at the end of the day, you know, you, you get in the car with knowing your destination, right? I know where I'm going. And, you know, if you're anything like me who I get lost in a box, you know, you'll you will in go, Sydney now. Oh, my God, I'm hopeless. Do you know how many times I go over the bridge when I try and meet people? You know that costs <laughs> you every time. <laughs> I literally cross toll, it. Like yeah. Toll fees a week. Yeah. I hate and the tolls. And I find myself <laughs> going the other way. And, then, like, yeah. and the thing is the, the um, map says I'm, like, 500 metres away from where I need to be. Yep. But and it's then something you. Pretty, like, oh my god! Yeah. Anyway, we're in the tunnel. It's up. Yeah, top. it's up yeah. the top. Yeah, it shouldn't be that hard. No. Um, but yeah. So look. So with that, you do you get lost in on your way. You you have idiot drivers that you know that freaking stuff you up. You know, it's exactly <laughs> the same as business. You get idiot people that you know supposed to do the right thing and they don't. Um, you know, so as I said, you know, when you I don't know if you guys don't look old enough to have teenage kids, but um, close. Close, right? But, you know, when you're actually sitting with your kid and you're teaching them to drive, the first thing you say is everyone's an idiot, right? Drive as if everyone, everyone. is an idiot. And then even though that's the rule, don't worry about it. Business is the same, right? Not that everyone's an idiot, but you have to go always just don't assume that everyone does the right thing. Don't assume things. So you have things like people have taught me that they will let you down. They will say Tuesday, but Tuesday never comes. You know? so, so you really have to be, you know, really, you know, always think about um, driving a car. Do you know what? That's a good point. Peter Irvine, I think he started, um, uh, what's it called again? Um, Gloria Jeans in Australia. And he, mm -hmm. and one thing I always took away from him, he said, you're either in turmoil, coming out of turmoil, or about to go back into turmoil. And as long as you become comfortable with, turmoil, hey, I'm in turmoil, I'm going to be out of it, it's okay, but know that I'm about to go back into it. Then you just get used to this cycle of constantly just movement and knowing that you'll be okay, but know to prepare that there's turmoil on the way as well. Um, yeah, the, the problem thought? with that is the problem with that is he's right, but the first time is really stressful. Yeah, right. The first turmoil of of the first legal letter, you go, what does that mean? You know, the first time someone steals from you, or the first some lies, or what? What all the first bads are really like quite particularly for someone like me who um I do trust really well and not as much now. <laughs> uh. Um but I, I but I do think that um I take it so seriously that I want to do the right thing and I'm a goody two shoes. Like if there's a rule to follow I follow. Mm. Um if there's a tax to pay I pay like I'm so straighty 180. And so the first for me were were like really quite confronting. And you know you learn things, right? You know legal like, so, you know, we had a um, a dispute from someone and they just made it up. Like, even though I had evidence to the contrary, they just made it up, right? And, like, you, your first thing you do in legal, you go, that's outrageous. It's about right and wrong. It's about, you know, I'm being hard done by, I want them to pay, you know. Da, da. And then you realise actually it has nothing to do with right and wrong. It's a process. And all you have to do is try and get out of this situation spending the least money as possible, mm -hmm. right? And it's not about right and wrong, unfortunately. Wish it was. Um, it's actually a process. So once you start, a bit like what you said about Peter, is once you understand that it's a cycle and things do happen, then you, you kind of just, you know, you just get, you do get on with it and you do try and manage that stress level because the stress, the first, the first are really quite scary. So you talked about managing stress levels and just getting on with it. At some point you decided to get on with it and scale Boost Juice. 
How do you, does someone do that from a capital point of view, from a national research point of view? Did you, did you factor in, was there, you know, the old four Ps, product, price, promotion and place? Was there like, hey, I've got this knowledge and I'm going to use it? Or is it a case of, do you know what, this thing's good and I'm just going to replicate it and I hope it works? Was there a process? Um, probably not. Like, again, you got to go back to that 32-year-old woman who um, – who's surrounded by people who are just, you know, we're just going for it, who has no idea, right? So if I said to someone, oh, look, by the way, um, I'm going to open a juice bar and I need about 100 stores in four years and, um, and yeah, so what do you think, right? They go, you are crazy, right? How are you going to fund it? How are you going to grow it? How are you going to build it? How are you doing it? We did that. Right, so 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 in actual fact, in some respects, you get in your own way. So I we started and uh, we opened you know one in the first year. I think we had the second one by by um, I think we had the second one by the end of that year. Still the in Adelaide, year the second five. one. Yeah, yeah, Adelaide. Yep. Yeah, so so a lot of them were Adelaide. Then we started Adelaide. in Melbourne, Jam Factory in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, and how it was was because we created this really great iconic early early you know adapters business you know, people would walk down the, the the street with green cups and they you know they'd kind of like cheese each, each other, other. Yeah. like <laughs> it was so cool right it was so cool so because we had this plan we had literally thousands of people lined up to want to be franchises right, right? so so we had so we had the, the store we had the stores and then and then my husband was a phenomenal he was incredible about leasing like he knew how he just knew how to do it and so he would come home one day like we were really early days and like yeah we were just we were just like we didn't have money like no one gave us any money so it was like we had some equity in our house maybe a couple of hundred thousand was pretty much all we had in our life so we came home and he had literally he said I've just done a deal with Westfield we've got to open 25 stores in 12 months and um, the liabilities were about five million dollars right it was like, and you just go, okay, let's get on with this, shall we? Productive. There's that again. trust, the trust coming through again. Trust or fear? Fear <laughs> of shit. How are we going to do this? But that's okay, we'll work it out. And I think that's the whole point. You just work it out, right? You go, okay, what do I need? All right, I need to externalise that or I need someone to come in to do that or I need someone to to go through these hundreds of franchises. Okay, so I need, so I need these are the people. And it ended up being a group of um three other women and to this day I still keep in contact with them yeah they're all in their 20s we all have no idea we're all working you know late nights with pizzas creating this incredible um journey in the early days and we all had this incredible incredible care factor you know when you're in that sporting team where everyone wants to win the grand final so everyone trains really hard and they put in extra and you know so this is what I had with this incredible team what were their um, jobs uh, one was um, recruitment and franchising. One was legal. Actually, we're doing so many leases that the the legal the girl that was doing it worked for the legal firm. And I said, for God's sake, just come work with me. <laughs> so she came over, and the other was an accountant. Wow. So, um, so yeah, we sort of just basically went, okay, how are we? And then we'd we'd go, we'd sit around and brainstorm, and you know, we were all incredibly naive. But we all knew that we'd reach out for people who had been there before. So we weren't stupid enough to think that we had the answers. In actual fact, the humbleness of what we knew we didn't know meant that we didn't make mistakes or we didn't make many mistakes or we made a lot of mistakes but no bad mistakes. Mm -hmm. That's good. So, so it's a good point, the humbleness of not knowing, you know, things but also the energy and the, I guess the drive to want to achieve things. You know, you've been involved with Shark Tank before. How much of it is the pitch? Like your partner, you said, hey, we've done a deal with Westfield. That's a pitch. You know, that's, that's a sell to a major organisation. How often did you have to do that and how important was it every step of the way? I did it without knowing it because I was, I was so and, and still so passionate about the business that it's, it was infectious, the, the whole, you know, this is what we're doing and what we're creating and, you know, this is amazing, and, you know. So you, and, you know, you, have, you throw youthful enthusiasm at it. And um, you're not selling, you're just sharing this this um, excitement with other people. You know, it was like, um, you know, I was travelling around, around the world with um, Jacinta, who was the girl I mentioned in franchising, and 
we were doing, you know, I was 30 something, she was 20 something, and we were doing all these million dollar deals all over the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we were just like going, I don't know how that happened, but let's go. <laughs> do it. Let's. I remember sitting down in, um, in, I was in Dubai and I was in this big room and there was that, you know, thing that they smoked and they were all in the long, long white dresses with the, the hats and the, and we're just sitting there going, okay. But, you know, the thing is though, if, I, what I loved about it is that, they might have thought we were these, you know, easy go lucky people, but we were our back end was as tight as a drum, and we knew exactly what we were doing to get the deal done. You know, people often say, you know, have you ever felt um, anything different being a woman in business, right? And I've got to say that it's been a huge advantage um, because you just one, you're often the only you're the only woman in a room often. They don't quite know what to do with you because I've had four weeks, a whole week of just dealing with men, and they go, "Oh, hang on, you, you remind me of my wife or my daughter or my sister," and I can't see them in this room. So it was it was awesome because then they're off they're off their game. <laughs> that's that's so good to hear because you know um, you know most of our clients are in the building industry, so therefore you know it's a little bit new uh, or you know and more accepted now but it was a little bit foreign in the beginning to have females in construction and then there was that sense of hey i need to prove that i know things whereas uh, you know we had lena on last week and she was you know one of the first females in construction and she just brought this you know different angle that was so warming and relationship style that embrace people and brought them together and created this momentum that was something that a lot of people couldn't achieve and it was it was really refreshing to hear and even with mm-hmm. you talking about you know um, being the only female in the room and the 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 advantage you had is really refreshing versus oh I felt inferior or I felt like I struggled or felt like and you didn't mm-hmm. have to prove anything then if anything you're saying you had a competitive advantage it's totally so good. I had him I had it nailed it was like you come across the guy that you know the, the he was so well, a 60 year old guy who you know and he would help me all the way to signing the contract I wanted him to sign yeah. <laughs> so, that is awesome. well oh, look, you know the thing the thing is though I never saw um I never saw myself as female male I just saw myself as as doing a job and getting it done and I was very much on outcome okay I need this outcome and so I never ever felt ever once did I feel that being a woman was a negative or being a woman had anything. And when people say to me, what's the difference between have, and doing business as a woman and a man? I say, there's none, right? No difference, right? The man wants to be home with his kids too. Guess what, right? The man has the same challenges as I. This a woman came up to me and said, oh, look, Janine, can you help me, right? I get really intimidated when I'm, a group, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm in a room of men doing business. I said, that's your problem. It's not their problem. You're, you're getting in your own way. Why do you think you're less than? Why do you think you go in a room and they're intimidating? If they're only, if you think they're intimidating, why are you thinking that they're better or smarter? Or I never thought that. I was absolutely the least educated in every room, but I never once did I feel less than. That's so good. Really important for people to hear that. Um, you you mentioned you know the man that wants to be at home with the kids, and you know no different to you. You want to be at home with the kids. What was it like? You know that not that, always, not always. Yeah, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you don't. Um, but, it's easier. It's easier not being home. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it's one of those things. You go on a journey, you have your seasons, and one of those big seasons is is raising children when they rely on you. Um, mm. But yet you had a business that relied on you. You had a partner sort of that relied on you. There's so many things going on in that moment of time. How did you handle that? And how did we, did you call on support? Did you, you know, do it yourself? Did you do it poorly? Did you do it well? How, how do you think? How do you think you went? Uh, I think there's a reason that mothers hung out with me to feel good about their parenting. Uh-huh. Right. Um, look, I, I was the mother that would turn her kids up to school and on the wrong day. You know, I was the mother that, you know, they were always wearing the wrong uniform. Or, you know, the day you get the car park at the front of the school, and go, I've got the car park and I'm the only one there. Like that, that was me, you know. Um, but, you know, I always so found that, you know, I would, I would try and include them as much as possible. So if I was traveling into state, I'd bring one with me and then we would be, you know, we'd have sort of a special time. I'd try and do, you know, give me, I asked the kids to give me a day a year where they would, it'd just be the, their day, right? So, and I'd take the day off and it'd just be for them. Or the, my kids never had to go, go to school on their birthday. If they wanted to, they could, but they didn't have to. So it was sort of trying to put things in place. Um, but, you know, there was times when it all fell apart. Like there was times, 
there was times when I should have been picking my kids up and I thought my mum was and they were still at school till 6.30, right? <laughs> um, I was very lucky, though. I had my mum to help. So she would come over to my house most days and um, feed them and, you know, get them ready. So I'd come in with a, you know, head. Probably in fairness, between 32 and 40, it was just a blur. You know, I had little kids at home, um, you know, was lack of sleep, working crazy hours, you know, and but the only thing I suppose I did right was I set myself up to succeed as much as possible. So I was always within five kilometres of the office so I could, um, you know, you know be, or, or equally but very close to the school. So I was always there for, you know, all the events, all the Christmas parties, all the – we were always there for the sporting events, you know. But, you know what, I did heaps wrong, right? But I look at my kids now. We, Yeah, they're, they're all older now than my 15-year-old daughter who's still at home. And they've got their, their thing, but they're good humans, right? They're really good humans. And so, you know, I haven't done everything right, actually a lot wrong, but you know what? At the end of the day, you look around and everyone's happy to be with each other. I've got all sorts of types of kids. I've got from hippies to capitalists to, you know, but, you know, so, so, but they're all really good people and it's a really good family. So I go, look, not perfect, um, but you know what? Everyone's great. Have they and all the, been casual employees at Boost Juice? One has. Oh. Riley did. Riley was uh, casual. Oliver, Oliver, the one of my my second son was very much. He felt very, you know, he found the kids going. Do you get a free smoothie at school a lot? <laughs> right. Um, Riley was like, yeah, my mum's Boost Juice. Like I'm cool. So it's different. Yeah. Different kids deal with it differently, you know. And so yeah, so different. And, yeah, so Riley was like, how can I leverage this to get what I want? And Olive was like, la, 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 I do, you know, <laughs> don't, don't even mention my mother. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've heard you said your 32 to 40 was crazy, but I've heard people say your 30s and 40s are the most chaotic or the toughest part of your life. And and the reason being is we're usually typically getting a little bit older, a little bit slower. We're trying to run a business, trying to advance our career or our our, uh, our role in a business. And yet- The mortgage is the biggest it's ever mortgage, been. Mortgage, all those yeah. sorts of things. And it's just pulling you in all sorts of different directions. Um, you know, how do you, I guess, how do you overcome that? Are you a routine person? Are you somebody that goes, hey, I'm gonna allocate an X amount of time to this and I'm going to, go for a surf at five o'clock in the morning and I'm going to do these sorts of things that make me a better person or give me the best outcome overall. What What is it? Do you, do you do that? No, between 32 and 40, no. I was pretty much, it was just head down, bum up. Um, I would play netball every Tuesday. Other than that, I, I remember one day sitting down thinking, when was the last time I ate? And it was four days. Like, so it was, it was seriously just go for it. I think if you look at photos of me at 40, um, I seriously look about 60, right? Like, so. Because you were so just all about business and just, yeah, yeah, wow. I had I had hair literally that touched my bum because I never went to go to the hairdresser. Just never went to the hairdresser. Cur <laughs> curly, curly hair. Looked like a full-on hippie. Could run naked in a bush, no problem. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so it was just, it was just about learning, hanging on, um, being there for the kids. Uh, we sold our home to fund the business. So, you know, so we put, all, we put all that money because no one would give us a loan. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so you just kind of go for it. I, I, honestly, I feel healthier now than I've ever felt before. At what point did you decide to franchise, sell some of them? And was that like giving your baby away, given the trust that you've had? I've, I'm a bit of a control freak. I would have been like, I'm handing my baby over. Or no, I, how did it feel? It was, an e it was a really easy decision, in actual fact, because I needed that we were growing so fast that um, I didn't think I could hire people that had that care factor, that ownership, quicker than I could franchising. And some of our franchisees are amazing people and they've been with me pretty much from the start. They're some awesome people. Some don't so, sell. No, some don't sell, which is great, you Love know, because it. it's a real family. And, um, and so, you know, so really, no, franchising was just another form of business. Mm -hmm. And what I learned, I didn't even know what franchising was at the start when I opened the first store, but you know, learned how to do it and what it was. And I was really I was so passionate about the brand that I didn't want to um, just, I didn't, well, didn't care about selling them. I would rather open them myself. So it was really about uh, really recruiting the right people. And so for everyone who applied, so if there was 100 people applied, 
only 7% actually got through. I was so, so particular. What were you looking for? And it didn't, um, the, the right person. I didn't care if they had retail experience before, but that real right, the per, mo, mostly people that really love customers and love people. I was really looking for that customer-focused person. That's important, super important, because as I've always said, you can have all the right skills, but if you haven't got a good attitude, forget it. Um, now, I, I can't get past the naked running in the bush, right? So you almost did that with S Survivor. You were in the bush and you, you, you applied yourself in that. What was the challenge? What was the attraction there? I think, um, I mean, how would it? Like, so, so they come up, they ask. Same, I'd love to it. do it. Yeah, I wouldn't like, and you wouldn't, um, wouldn't apply for it but when they knock on the door and they go hey would you like to do this like I love Survivor I've always watched it and you think wow I mean you think okay it's it's a month or two on your life in your in your life you know you, you're not they're not gonna you're not gonna die right so if the worst case scenario they can helicopter you out I thought you couldn't die until you get there and you go actually you could. Good. <laughs> um, and um, so yeah so I thought why not you know how could you say no to that so I sort of thought about it Spoke to my family and went, you know, I should be, you know, I said, to be honest, they'll probably kick me out early, so I won't be there long. See you in a couple of and, weeks. And then I was, yeah, and I was in there for about 44 days. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. And, like, I'm not a big girl anyway, but I lost about 10 kilos. I was, like, I didn't realise that, you know, that thing on your bottom, like, you know how it's a bit juicy, right? It's actually padding. Yeah, yeah. I didn't it's helpful. It, right? And then when it goes, it's literally bone on dirt. It's really uncomfortable. <laughs> so if you ever get really skinny, you'll really notice Take a cushion. Down, it's not comfortable, right? <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm never... We been only do it for enough. comfort, don't we? That's we why I have a big butt, yeah. Yeah, so, so that it's comfortable, yeah. For no other reason. No other reason. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, don't lose it because it gives you a lot of comfort. <laughs> Good to know. But no, look, and, you know, the, the friendships you get from, from it, like, I mean, and the enemies. Yeah. There's some people that don't like me. Um, but, you know, Pia Miranda, I don't know if you know Pia Miranda. Yeah. You know, gorgeous, gorgeous actress. actress. Yeah, Looking actress. For Ella Brandy. Um, oh, yes. Okay, of course. Yeah, so she's, like, to this day, you know, years later, you know, she, I would Still speak, a friend. I would, we would be in contact every day. Wow. Like, And, you know, it's funny, you know, that we, we caught up with um, one of, Abby, one of the girls had a wedding, and all us, we were all basically catching up and, you know, we're all sharing beds and we're all sharing, you know, rooms and everyone's walking around naked. And, that, like, you just get to a whole new level of, of um, like, it, it doesn't matter. That's it doesn't it. matter. Yeah. <laughs> like, you go, ah, well, there's two beds. That's four. There's five of us. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. <laughs> so you, you mentioned during business you went four days without eating. How, how long do you think you really could survive without food and water in the bush, like Survivor style? I think you can. You know, you, you do get um, – I went in there. I, I'm a big research person, so I went in there. I did a big keto to go in there because keto stops you getting too hungry. So I did that going in. Um, I didn't find the lack of food that big a deal. A lot of the guys did. Like there's big Sean. He's six foot seven, and you know, um, Blackie, yeah, you know, Simon Black, uh, the footballer. I think a lot of them struggled with the food, but for me, it wasn't too bad. I mean, I think you you get used to it, and the and you get some rice and beans, but I think you can. If you, your mind's busy you, and if you, your, adrenaline's, your adrenaline's going, your body doesn't need food. Yeah. It needs yeah. water, but yeah. doesn't need food. Like it. So, so we've had um, Matty Purcell on the podcast before, the, the champion that he is. You, you've, you've teamed up recently with Matty. Um, tell us about that. How does that even happen? Matty Purcell, local Newcastle bloke, reaches out to Janine and you say yes to working together. How, how, tell yeah. us about that. We did an interview uh, years ago together and look it was it was a really good interview you know and we just was I was being approached by a couple of people to sort of talk about some sort of education and I'm a big one on like if I wish I I had someone to guide me in the early days I would have avoided a lot of heartache and a lot of um a lot of pro pro problems that didn't need to happen so um so Maddie is a great educator and, and passionate I'm equally as passionate for it so we're sort of like we sort of just kind of went, okay, let's um, let's put this together. So it have taken about two years to to put it together, and, um, and we're really proud of it. It's a really good course. It's basically all the stuff that I've had uh, that in my in my data that I've been using and, and my tools that I've used for years, and we've kind of you know made it made you know. 
flashed it up so it's a really good course. And, um, you yeah, know, the Business Academy is it's not for just people that are thinking about business, you know, it's for people in, in every level, thinking about it, starting up, or even a multi a multi business, like a big business in the millions. Um, and it's really just what I believe people should know or should do uh, to create a sustainable brand and business. I think it's really important. And, and what I've seen over the years, I mean, it, people are, are open and welcome to, you know, help you know, they're, they're, sorry, the dog was there in the corner. I'm not too sure where it's gone. but Yeah, no, he's gone over there. <laughs> another one that just grabs clothes and just puts them all over my house. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, but people are open to being mentored. They're open to being coached. They're open to support as long as, you know, they're people who can understand their world and they've been there before and, and are going to add value. And it sounds like this is something that is going to add value. Because you have been there before, you've got great wisdom, and if anything, you come. What my my impression of you is, you just want to help people, you know, accelerate from where you know so many years ago, and give them the secrets and the tips and the structure. I guess is that fair to say? Yeah, I always thought that what how I thought was common sense. I always thought that doesn't everyone think like this? And I was surprised that not a lot of people don't think about it. Like in some of the stuff I'd say, they go, "Oh my god, that's extraordinary!" I'd like. Well, not really, <laughs> but and so then, but I'm a very structured person, so I can. I think if I had a superpower, it's to make complicated things simple, mm. and so I can really work things down or create create something that people see, perceive as complicated and make it really simple to understand, and not only understand to execute it into a way that's effective for them. So one of the things that I'm a firm believer in, we talked about before, about, you know, before you get to the car to have a roadmap of where you're going, is to talk about getting people to create that roadmap. But more importantly, have a, we call it a D-Day document, have a document that actually makes people accountable and it's actually tangible instead of just going, oh, hi, nice people, right, or, or have good people in your business, right, instead of just going like that, which is sort of fluffy, it's more going, all right, list the people in your business, what are they doing? Where can they improve? Like it's really like it's not just um, hire good people. Yeah. <laughs> we talk about how to do it, how to monitor it, how to, um, you know, if people aren't working out, how to how to adjust that. So just it's, just stuff that you need to know. It's a good point because you're right, there is a there is a lot of fluff out there and you're right, get good people. Yeah, awesome, but how do I get good people and what do they look like and where do I put them, how do I afford them? So it's a bit more, it sounds like you've actually added a layer of, of simplicity but also a layer of depth to okay this is why this is how this is what we're after and and have you done that in all areas of business is it does it cover that in marketing does it cover it in operations and I guess what are the quick things that you say hey this is what you're going to get out of the program you know do you cover key areas or not yeah no we cover it all we cover people marketing we cover um, finance we, we cover everything in the four days my my hope is um, that in 12 months' time after the course, that they've implemented the changes and made a difference and it becomes just second nature. That's my hope, right? Some people do courses and think it's a good idea and then over time they just all the bad habits come back in. But, you know, the, for the people who get it and the people who really want to, to you know, drive the business, it, would make, it makes that journey easier if you have this roadmap. And as I said to you before, it's as simple as going, you wouldn't get into a car unless you know the destination, right? You wouldn't do it. So this is this is creating a destination, but it's also showing you the way to get there mm -hmm. in a practical way. To, you know how there's boys, boy directions and girls' direction? Like boy <laughs> direction will go, you know, this road and go left and, you know, they'll, they'll make it really complicated. And girls go, go to the White House, turn left at the White House. Now there's a bush on the left that's got pink flowers go left of the bush, like women do it like you can't get it wrong. Do you turn right? the map upside down while you're doing that? Is that right? Is it? No. <laughs> no. I'm no, sorry. Just, That's what my wife uh, used to do was turn oh, no, the map upside down. Oh, no, seriously, I was. I used to have Melways. I was a Melbourne girl. I used to be, Melways was beside my car as I was driving, trying to work out where I'm going. Yeah. So, so I mean, you've got the, the, you've got the structure, you've got the, the, the roadmap, as you say, how do you how do you help with discipline? Is that a case of tough? You're gonna to be you're gonna be you're gonna have the attitude. You've got to have the work ethic, or is there something that helps with that? 
that you feel that, you know, because some people are registered for every course on, on the earth and never do anything with it or never action anything. Is there anything in there or some advice around, you know, be motivated or it's a case of tough, suck it up, you just got to do it? No, look, you know, like someone said to me, they came into the office and said, Janine, how do we motivate the team, right? Let, tell me how to motivate the team. I said, it's really easy, right? Super easy. You ready? Okay, ready. Hire motivated people, right? You know, the I get up every morning to surf. It's not because I'm motivated. It's just because I love doing what I do, right? So if you want to do it, you will do it. If you don't, you'll make an excuse, right? It's as pretty simple as that, you know. But if someone's going to pay, you know, it's a couple of thousand dollars for the course, which is four days, um, if they're going to pay that, uh, people will turn up, right, if they've gone to that effort to do it. And that's why, in actual fact, you should, because if, if something's for free, people have no value to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important for people to um, invest in their business because it'll they'll make it back 10 times. Yeah, I like that. Luke Lewis, the former footballer, he used to train on Christmas Day. And he goes, I'm going to train on Christmas Day because I know my competition is going to be training on Christmas Day. And it was those little things that it's a nice little takeaway to go, I want a competitive advantage and I want to be ahead of my competition. So, yeah, you're right. High-motivated high people is a really good start because, as we always say, if they can't get out of bed, they're useless. That's really yeah. nice. So we've, we've, we've been on a journey between striving to play for Australia, but let's just say in netball, you know, we start Bush Juice, we, we work on David Bowie's boat, you know, we do all these crazy things. Um, we raise awesome children, a great family, like, which is really important. Um, what's next? What's 10 years down the track look like for you? I'm trying to work out what I want to be when I grow up. Professional <laughs> surfer. Sorry, professional, professional surfer. Let's other, go. other than being a professional surfer. Don't write off netball actually, yet either. That's still on the still cards. Still on the cards. Still on the cards, yeah. Actually, I went back to play netball, really, for a couple of games. Actually, I've still got it. Just How are your knees? Still got it. Still got it. But actually, pretty good. Good. Actually, pretty good, yeah. What no, about the um, competitiveness? I want to know. Oh, you seem like a competitive person. Oh, no, I was vicious. Yeah. I was. But so I was, was everyone else on the court. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. I, mate, I was, they were like, oh. <laughs> so no, it's still there. It's Tapes still there. the nails down, did all the right things. Yeah, did all the, the right take the earrings out. Um, look, there's there's lots of look. I'm um, you know I've just started. You know, as I said, we life's in a, in a whole lot of clubs. Um, the you know the business academy is really a, a big deal for me. Trying to get that you know to to a level that's good. Um, you know, really getting involved with whether it's education through the social media, whether it's YouTube. I mean, if anyone's watching, I've sort of started a YouTube channel. Um, with just a whole lot of just putting a whole lot of data out there and information and thoughts and tips and and you know what what I believe, um, you know I, I I enjoy my play with TV. I've got as we mentioned earlier the um, the Gordon Ramsay. You know I had a lot of fun playing with him at, for Food Stars uh, in businesses. Um, did you have to lift the, your, your your swear word ratios, or how did that work to balance that out? I, unfortunately, <laughs> I think I can keep up with him. Oh, wow! Yeah. <laughs> so, which is which is you know, sort that of, on and, the but the thing court. is, because he does he, look, he does swear a lot. I think it's like a tick, like he does f and blind all the time, and um, and the, so you do get into a bit of a habit where you just kind of let everything go and just you, you kind of go with it, and then you have to practice not swearing when you actually get home. Uh, now he look, he's got. He's such a high energy guy. He is just, and if he's not, if he's bored, he just gets naughty. He's like a fifty-seven-year-old kid, but in the best possible way. So no, we had we had a lot of fun together and had great conversations, and you know, so it's um it was a lot of fun to do. Actually, it was one of probably one of my other other than Survivor for different reasons. I really enjoyed Survivor and equally hated it. Um, but Food Stars was probably one of my favourite shows to do. Actually. So over the next 10 years, will there be more Boost juices? Is that still growing or is it just humming now? No, no, Boost is growing. Um, Betty's Burgers is growing. Um, so, you know, we're, we're doing that. Uh, so, you know, my, my family, uh, my husband and son are doing a Yochi, um, which is a, a frozen yoga concept, which is they, they're doing really well. So I sort of help on the peripherals a little bit there, but not much. Um, they need to do the Business really Academy. Yeah, so really, you know, um, you know, it's also, as you always should have, is a curious mind. And so there's going to be things popping up all the time. In the world that we're living in now with, um, you know, AI, which speeds things up to a astronomical level, you know, I think it does create more opportunities and, and um, 
you will see. Watch this space. Love it. Well, we think you're a super person, one of those super people you mentioned at the very beginning. It's been great chatting to you. Thank you for being part of the podcast. No, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.